what lies right at the core of, of Sloan uh, is what we've got on the page here, um, which is the proposition not just of equipping people with technical skills, important as they are, for a successful career, uh, but it's about getting to what lies at the core in terms of what our careers and lives are really about and what we might do to transform them. Because I don't believe that um, any of us would have taken a year out of our careers and lives if we hadn't had a large aspiration that we wanted to get to grips with, um, to, give, um, to give teeth to, uh, in order to bring about um, a different kind of meaning, perhaps, than the kind of meaning we'd been living with pre-Sloan. So Sloan is um, uh, very close to my heart because the theme of transformation uh, itself um, is um, extremely important to me personally. And I've been lucky enough to, to work that out uh, in our class sessions and in many conversations with many of you here in the room and your colleagues and your colleagues over the year and over the years. And what we'll be doing is to put a spotlight on exactly that theme. Um, the theme of transformation of careers and lives through a panel discussion, which will follow very shortly, where we've got panelists from the LBS Sloan, from, from MIT and Stanford, and um, we'll be asking exactly that question. Um, what's the Sloan experience done for our panelists and by extension um, for everyone in the room? Let me, let me say a few words first, um, reflecting back on the past, because and, and I must apologise to some of the more recent Sloans who will have seen a picture, LBS Sloans, who will have seen a picture like this before. Um, but if I cast my mind back to, let's say, 1995, when I first appeared on Sloan, the world looked a little bit like this. Do we, do we have, by the way, any people in the room who enjoy sailing, enjoy getting out on a boat on a beautiful day? Yep, yep. Uh, what kind of day is this? That was well, you got light winds and you're headed down the wind. Ah, it's a lovely day, isn't it? Yeah. It's a lovely day. And we've got um, that gentle tailwind coming from behind. Um, we can see out onto the horizon. And I can't quite make out um, what's going on at the back of the boat, um, whether, the, whether the skipper there might possibly be enjoying a glass of gin and tonic as that <laughs> boat is underway. Now, with, without, without, wanting to, um, without wanting to resort to hyperbole, back in 1995, for a lot of us, the world looked rather like this, which was to say the Cold War was over, there were the relatively gentle macroeconomic tailwinds, and as we looked out into the future, well, we could follow a steady course. And that might well have been the case not just for our businesses, but also for ourselves, as we thought about the pattern that our careers might follow. That's casting our minds back 21 years to the way the world might have been. And you know what? Um, at that time, um, strategy professors like me used to say that what you need if you're going to succeed is to have a clear vision. That's the star out there in the, in the top right. By the way, have you noticed that invariably the good place on those strategy slides is in the top right? <laughs> and if you, ever look, if you ever look at the pictures that your children put on the fridge at home in the kitchen, you'll always see the sun in the top right, won't you? And, and I think the strategy consultants have been able to plant that cognitive psychology hook. So, so up there in, in the top right is the good place that we're aiming for, which we might contrast with where we are today. And then we'd ask ourselves, if we're business strategists, back in those days, 21 years ago, what are the steps that are going to close the gap, the resources that we need to put in place, the, the, the opportunities that we need to grasp? And we'd be able to follow in a stepwise, sequential way that path to heaven. Any problem with that? What might it rely on? What might it rely on? Uh, so it does rely on us being able to see out into the distance, uh, out to the horizon. Um, for those of you who perhaps um, come from the IT world, and I know there are a number in the room, uh, you might remember in the old days the waterfall style of project management. Again, we need great, a great degree of certainty 
and foresight and vision in order to entertain that view of what we're about. Now, as it was for business strategy, I'd argue at that time it often was for our career strategies. Those of you from MIT will, of course, know Edgar Schein. Edgar Schein's worked very well. Edgar Schein used to talk about career anchors, which is to say early on we define our career anchor in terms of our working identity that we'd be progressively fulfilling through our working lives. Again, it perhaps depends very much on the proposition of a following wind and a clear view out to the horizon. The weather's changed, hasn't it, for, for all of us in the room since 1995, to varying degrees. For some of us, of course, there'll be periods when the clouds lift and then we can simply get on with driving towards the goal. But um, for a lot of us, and I speak personally here as well, we don't really know what might be coming out of the fog. And the wind, where's the wind coming from now in that picture? Well, you're actually in a really good position there. Probably like that. <laughs> <laughs> now, say more. Now, now this, th 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 this, is, this is a great insight, and I'm, I'm delighted that these simple graphics have been mined so thoroughly already <laughs> in, in, the true, in the true Sloan spirit. Um, the, the aerofoil property of the sail is what you're referring to, which is to say that if you get the boat trimmed just right, you can go even faster than when the wind's behind. Um, but, of course, the wind is likely to change. And then, when the wind changes, we've also got to be extraordinarily agile in ensuring that our crew shift their weight across the boat. And if we get it right, arguably there are many more ways to win than there might have been in the old days when we had the wind behind us. In fact, one of my colleagues at London Business School, Andrew Scott, who many of the LBS Sloan Fellows will have known well over the years, looks at volatility and the impact of volatility on corporate performance. And it turns out that in periods of greater volatility, there's a bigger and bigger gap between relative winners and relative losers. When we all had the wind, the gentle wind, the gentle macroeconomic wind coming from behind, the variance of profitability across companies in a given sector was much less than in the periods that are highly volatile. So you're absolutely right. If we get it right, we can win. But we have to learn, don't we, how to navigate in those foggy conditions where it's not going to be a steady course and when we need to make the, the judgment call as to when we're going to shift our weight across the boat, which from a standpoint of business strategy and strategy execution means that instead of um, taking a linear approach, we have to take a much more iterative, much more experimental approach to um, uncover uncover possibilities, to uncover those opportunities that we might be driving for. And so it might be when we come to personal strategy and career strategy, which has huge implications because much of what we used to teach back in 1995 was still very much in that linear, linear frame, whether we're talking about strategy for our companies or, for that matter, strategies for our careers. And what we may need to do in these conditions is to develop what I'd call a set of meta-skills. Finance, economics, operations management, all those staples of a business school um, degree program, of course they matter. But what we also need to do, and what I hope we're looking increasingly to do on programs like Sloan, is to help develop the meta-skills which will enable us to succeed in the kind of environment that we can see on the screen. Um, we've got a remarkable woman here at LBS who's um, joined us from INSEAD, who some of you might well have come across, called Herminia Ibarra, um, who writes beautifully about career strategies. And I've stolen a leaf out of her book, adapting it slightly, as we all do <coughs> along the way, uh, in, in this slide, which is to say um, that, that it's not going to be a case of just pinning down the goal and going for it. We need the meta skill of making sense of what those opportunities and, for that matter, those dangers might be as they loom out of the fog. Those who are able to make sense and recognize patterns sooner than others 
are going to be those who will do best. Also, what we will need to do, rather than just going down one course, back to the IT analogy of waterfall versus scrum, we'll need to take a much more experimental, uh, much more experimental approach to the way in which we execute our personal strategies as well as our career strategies. And again, to make that possible, there's the question, what kind of company are we going to keep? And I believe part of the beauty of Sloan is that in the Sloan year at LBS, and I believe this to be true of Stanford, thinking back, uh, and I'm at IT, we developed the meta skill of being able to form radically new connections, thanks to the incredible diversity that we'll find in the Sloan class, which in turn gives us a ground on which we can forge those experiments and make sense of ourselves and the world in quite a different way. So, harking back to 1995 compared to the world, the Sloan world 21 years later, very different sailing conditions and a different set of skills. And what will be fascinating to explore now uh, is just how that might chime with the experience of our panellists. So what I'd love to do now would be to welcome our panellists on stage. If you'd like to make your way up, and we'll begin with some introductions. <laughs> And um, first of all, um, just, on, just on my right, uh, is Niall. And um, as, we, as we read across the room, um, we've got Rupert and um, Gil and um, Robin. So could we give, in the true Sloan tradition, um, a huge round of applause? <laughs> Sloans tend to do that even before the class has begun which is excellent. Um, what, what I'm going to do is to, to ask our panellists, first of all, to introduce themselves um, in turn, um, if you're willing. Sure. Um, we could um, we could perhaps begin with, with Niall. And um, the exam question is, is not too tough a one. Um, <coughs> why Sloan? Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps in, in the context of where you could come from and what you're doing now. Sure. Is the microphone working? I'm going to switch, switch it on. So, uh, Niall Henderson, uh, I was a, a graduate from MIT 2010. And so I think the first place to start is uh, on behalf of all of the MIT folks here today. It's a great pleasure to be here. So we thank very much the London team for expanding the site. I think you did it, the London only, the first year. And so it's great to be here to have the three schools together. Um, I may be somewhat of an outlier in that I've had 21 years with BP uh, in oil and gas. Uh, I guess many people are changing companies and, and you know, building their careers that way. <laughs> I started as a petroleum engineer, uh, and I'm currently in BP's mergers and acquisitions team. So in the spirit of this morning, what, what do I do? Uh, I sell oil and gas fields, uh, petrochemical plants. So if any of you want to buy an oil field, uh, <laughs> I'm happy to sell you one. Uh, so. Uh, why did I take Sloan? Uh, BP has quite a track record of, uh, we used to send one or two people uh, every year to Stanford. Uh, so we had over many, many years, 20, 30 years. So quite a few of our senior executive team are, uh, are Sloan graduates. Um, I was opted to go to MIT. I self-funded to MIT. Um, you know, the reasons for going, um, I actually had quite a narrow scope. You know, I just wanted to get a good business education because I'd, I'd moved from engineering into the commercial side of the business but I felt somewhat exposed that I didn't have any kind of formal training. So my reason to go to Sloan was quite narrow. Uh, and I have to say, you know, I was very pleasantly surprised. And, you know, it's, it's a much more expansive experience, as I'm sure everybody in the room can testify to. So it was a wonderful, uh, you know, a wonderful opportunity uh, from that perspective. So that's right. myself. Hi, I'm uh, Rupert Naylor. I'm, I'm probably the opposite of Niall, that I was always changing jobs uh, and always <laughs> trying to find the next best opportunity. So I'd been... Um, I'd been a diplomat, and I think, as Dominic was describing, it was around the late 90s when uh, we had a book released called The End of Democracy. End of, end of History. End of History. And then End of History was saying, it was about Fukuyama, I think, was saying, you know, <clears throat> we've finished wars, liberal democracy is the natural governmental form, and we're all going to be friends. And, and if you're a diplomat, that doesn't sound very interesting, right? Well, I mean, what's the point, right? You're going to spend your life <laughs> opening school fairs and, you know, that's fantastic. Um, 
And loads of, and I don't know if you remember the late 90s, any of you, but you go to a party, everybody would talk about how much money they were making. And there was me earning, you know, government, <laughs> government salary. Oh, my God. So I, was, <laughs> so I, um, I changed into banking. Um, naturally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was... <laughs> Once they st- I should have known that once they started hiring me, they should have, you know, it was a- things were about to go south. Um, and it wasn't long after that, I don't think that's correlated, um, that things went south in banking. And, um, you know, I had a couple of, couple of great years um, working 365 days a year as an M&A banker. That was fun. Um, and I thought, well, what, what industry can you rely on? What industry can you rely on? And what are we always going to need? And I thought, tell telecoms. So I went into a, a telecoms company. I was in Japan for a lot of this time. Uh, into a telecoms company in Japan and, you know, my business analysis was clearly not what it might be, although they hired me for a strategy role. And um, that was all great. Uh, and I, you know, I, I went into the business to try and help them buy other businesses, and I ended up selling the business I was in. And I got sent back to the UK, and that was good. And then they sent me to Jersey to set up a telco. And that was cool, and we you know, set it up. And then they said, no, we want you to go and do the same in the Isle of Man. So I don't know if you know where the Isle of Man is. Yeah. Maybe some of you do, but it's... Uh, it's where you get the rain, basically, in the Irish Sea, where the rain <laughs> stops because there's a little bit of a mountain. It's a terrible, you know. Anybody here from the Isle of Man, I, I'll chat to you later and apologise, but <laughs> it's yeah, just not a very aspirational place. So I thought, where, where the hell is my life going? You know, what, what have I managed to do? Um, and then I met a guy called Michael Geary, who some of you may remember, but he was a Sloan. And he was rhapsodising about this programme, about how fantastic it was. And I th- I'd missed the MBA boat because I'd, you know, just constantly thinking about money rather than life and he talked to me about it and I suddenly thought well, what a great opportunity to just reset and have a think about uh, about what my life's doing and the fact I'm ending up on a tiny island rather than you know, running the biggest company in the world or being a diplomat or something and and so I decided let's take a year and figure that out. Gil. Hi uh, Gil from uh, Stanford uh, originally from New York actually so engineer and computer engineer by training and, and practice and uh, I started a Data and analytics company about six years ago, uh, and kind of grew that between New York, London, and Bombay. Um, actually, started in the UK, uh, and when it hit about 70 people, I, I realized that uh, excuse my New York verbiage, but I, I'd exhausted my ability to bullshit running a company off of Google and Wikipedia, um, <laughs> and, and maybe needed to study some formal uh, business skills such as finance, accounting, marketing, etc. So it, it was, that was kind of part of it, is to fill out the gaps of what I knew so I could continue to, the grow, uh, continue to grow the company. But it was also uh, looking for additional opportunities. And, and more than that, I think, um, meeting interesting and like-minded people who are also ambitious. Um, uh, when, when you run a company, it could be a very lonely place when all decisions come to you, and that is your entire life. Uh, so with that, I kind of looked at options. And um, this loan program seemed I- ideal. Uh, I know I might look young, but I'm 34, so uh, a little too old for American MBA programs. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and I chose Stanford, and it's literally been the best year of my life. It's been absolutely phenomenal. I just graduated three weeks ago, and more than kind of filling in the gaps and opening up new opportunities, um, it shifted my perspective, and I, I learned uh, a plethora of things that I didn't know I didn't know, um, which has been phenomenal. Robin. Thanks, Dominic. Um, yeah, I'm a London Business School Sloan of 2002, um, and I'm now using Julian's advice this morning. I now work uh, as a business coach, uh, which means I'm paid by companies to work one-to-one with their senior executives, helping them work out what they want to do and how they want to do it. Um, my why Sloan um, reminds me that I'm, I'm a fairly contrarian person. So I was in a very small, small minority in my year at Sloan, and then I did Sloan thinking I didn't want to change career. Um, I thought I just wanted a year out of what had been quite an intense time for me uh, in my career prior to that. Uh, and then I imagined I'd then go back into my old industry in financial services and sort of live happily ever after. Um, the rest, virtually everybody in my class was doing Sloan because they wanted to change career. So I was a bit the odd one out in that sense. Um, and I find I'm the odd one out the other way around in that I've probably made a more radical career change uh, than <laughs> Not quite everybody, but certainly I've been a small minority of people who've made more, 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 a more radical career change. Um, and that was seven years after I'd done Sloan. Uh, and I remember the guy who ran Sloan when I first started saying, telling me uh, that it'll be the second or third job after Sloan that will define whether Sloan has been a success. Um, and I didn't really understand what he, was, what he was talking about when he told me, if I'm honest. 
um, but I now realise that, that that really was a great observation and great advice. Um, and when I look back on the career change I've made, I wouldn't say I've done it because of Sloan, but I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't done Sloan. Great. So, so our panellists have um, very kindly put um, spotlights on themselves as, as they were at the point when they were making that decision to come on Sloan. And, uh, of course, then the question is, well, how did it help? Um, perhaps um, it's early days for you, Gil. Uh, how, would you, how would you hope it'll help you looking forwards? Um, so I, I think there, there are three main things that I feel like I got out of the Sloan program beyond just filling out in the gaps of, of my knowledge and skill sets. Um, one has really been the people, both on a personal and professional front, and uh, uh, both those within the Sloan class, as well as the MBA class, as well as the alumni, as well as everyone involved uh, in the GSB community, and, and now I think the broader Sloan community, so I'm glad to be here. Um, it, kind of that network is, is tremendous. <laughs> I mean, having Eric Schmidt, chairman of Google, as one of my professors, <laughs> is, I, the perspective that you get is... is uh, so drastically different than anything I could have possibly imagined. Um, so really, that's the third item, is the perspective. So the people, the friends, the, the experience itself, the network that I've built, and, and the perspective that I have on, on business in general um, and on the outlook of my life. I mean, Stanford has a, a very cheesy, idealistic tagline of change lives, change organizations, change the world. Um, and, and somehow uh, the idealism brainwashes you and, and you kind of get bought into it. And I think it's taught me to think much bigger about the opportunities and the things that I'd like to do and, and my future trajectory. And now you, you, you followed ostensibly more of the steady course mm -hmm. with the wind behind you. <laughs> yes. Well, How's uh, the Sloan impacted, impacted your, your career within the context of, of BP? Sure. I mean, the steady course was abruptly disrupted. Uh, so I came back into BP uh, about three, you know, about a month after the Macondo accident. Ah. So it was anything but a, uh, a stable transfer. But um, I think, uh, you, so I got the business skills, corporate strategy, finance, which I use today. I got the opportunity to work in the US, which I might not otherwise have done. I got the opportunity to work in M&A. But the thing that uh, really um, I got value the most from my time at MIT, and it's to use the, the, the school's logo, so MIT's logo is uh, Men's and Manus, which is hand and mind. Mm. And uh, to graduate from the Sloan program at MIT, and it may be similar in London and Stanford, mm. you had to take a practical entrepreneurship class. Uh, so you actually had to do it as opposed to, to learn the theory of it. Um, I took one at MIT called Energy Ventures. Uh, and it was all about you know, how to commercialize, in my case, a piece of solar technology. So, uh, so I loved that. A, big, a guy mm. from a big corporate background suddenly getting the chance to do entrepreneurship. Um, and as a consequence, outside of work today, I, I spend a lot of my time uh, working with social entrepreneurs. Uh, there's one uh, alumni here, uh, Leanne, up in the back from LBS. I've uh, been supporting Leanne in an energy poverty project in the last few months. Um, and I also work pro bono, uh, CFO pro bono, for a small solar company in the UK, which is making a building integrated uh, photovoltaic panels so that the panel's in the window itself. <clears throat> so that's uh, a new dimension, which I simply didn't have before. Um, but Sloan clearly is a good bedrock for your you know, <coughs> linear progress through a big corporate, but it's expanded the horizons uh, mm -hmm. so much more outside of uh, the big corporate. And as you're saying, even in the same company, in the same organization, um, it's not as if you've got the same steady wind behind all exactly. the time by it's any means, indeed. by any means. Yeah. Rupert, how has it impacted you? Um, well, I suppose I was always working for big organisations, and so I set up a venture with a couple of guys while I was at Sloan to invest in telcos, and um, that made made millions, actually, really brilliant. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I left before it uh, before it made all that money. <laughs> Sadly, because unlike the other two people I was with, uh, I needed to you know pay a mortgage and uh, you know do stuff like that and. I could only go so long before I finally ran out of money. So that was a shame. They were very successful. They were very grateful when they made the money, but that didn't, you know, didn't give me anything. Um, so, so that was a bit of a shame. So then I, then I just thought, I've got to get some money. So I went into consulting. And I remember Lyndon Selby saying to me, God, you're not doing this. You cannot go into consulting if, you're going to, if you've done the Sloan. I mean, what a waste of, what a, waste of a year. And I did, but that's what I did uh, because I just needed some money. And, and, and but I kept thinking about it. Yeah, she's totally right. But, you know, you're sort of stuck in there. You're working so hard. You haven't got time to think about it. Um, but you know, it did, I guess, 
give me that sort of sense of, well, what should I be doing? And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely, uh, you know, hard to fit into to jobs. But a headhunter approached me uh, hmm. about this job that required somebody who'd set up a company before, which I'd done, and been a consultant. So I suddenly realised I'm pretty rare and pretty special. Um, and that was going, you know, felt good for once in my life, rather than people saying, well, you've never done this, you know, you know, it's like, oh, God. Um, so, so then I, so I was hired to um, run the region, run Europe and uh, now EMEA for um, a, a US software company involved in um, uh, predictive technology. And um, I think the great thing about Sloan was, it, I guess it gave me the, you know, the confidence that when doing that to, to know what I should be doing. And a lot of that wasn't, I've got to be the deepest in this technology. It's, it's well, I've just got to talk to people, listen, and, and you know, trust my instincts to the right degree, and uh, we'll do well. And it's, it's you know, been an incredible journey. We've uh, you know, grown massively over, over the past few years. I'm hiring loads of people. I even actually, I was at Bain, you see, and I had a, a Bain partner applying for a job to work for me, which was quite good. So it shows how it's sort of come all around. That, uh, having worked as this consultant all these years, uh, they actually now wanted to work for me. Sadly, he didn't quite make the grade, but um, <laughs> wasn't my own. <laughs> so no, so it just gave me that confidence to uh, just you know, realize it's you just if, if you you know there's enough out there, and Sloan gives you that idea that you you're not alone in not knowing everything, but you know enough to do a good job. When when we talk about um, Sloan, of course, there's the Sloan year. Um, what happens on campus and around campus? Um, during that very intense year, but a lot of people in the room, I'm sure, have had the experience that Sloan never really ends. Uh, and indeed, we talk about um, the Sloan Fellowship, and uh, sometimes the Sloan Fellowship conjures up a sort of rather Oxford and Cambridge atmosphere of the high table and the fellows dining and sipping excellent claret. Um, but there's also the sense of the fellowship in the literal sense, uh, in terms of fellow journeyers along the way. And question for Robin, um, because uh, as, we, as we look at the Sloan vintages yeah. represented on the panel, um, you're all the way back to 2002. What, what's your sense of this being a continuing community and how might that have helped you? Yeah, I would say the, the, the personal friendships, the personal network that I gained from Sloan uh, is probably the or probably actually is certainly the most the biggest thing I think I got out of the year um, genuine, genuinely transformational um, we were, I'm sure like all Sloan, Sloan years, we think we were pretty closely bonded, we certainly partied a lot um, uh, but we've remained pretty pretty close I think we, we won some sort of LBS prize for having the highest participation or something in our 10 year reunion Mm. Uh, I was in Australia last year for a reunion. Um, I'm going to be in New York in September for another reunion. Mm. Uh, I'm godfather to one of my classmates' ch children. Um, so I'd say it's much more a personal level that it's uh, had a massive impact on me. Um, I'm probably not uh, typical, and I haven't really used the Sloan network, the Sloan Fellowship, particularly to help my career. Mm. Um, but there certainly are others in, in my class who have found the, 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 the connections and, and, and the, the, uh, uh, the, use in, the use and sense of being introduced by classmates to, to other aspects of their business. I say that hasn't particularly uh, benefited me, <laughs> largely because I haven't sought it. Um, but it, say the, the personal aspect has genuinely transformed my life. Mm -hmm. can, can you say a little more about that personal aspect? And yeah, and I, I'd, I'd led a, a bit of a sheltered life, I suppose, before I did Sloan. I'd been to a very traditional British boarding school. I'd been to a very particularly traditional British university. Uh, mm -hmm. I then worked, as we say in Britain, in the city, so in financial services, uh, in a relatively conventional, uh, well, not relatively, actually, very conventional uh, uh, background. Um, I'd hankered after going to, to, to London, but to, to business school, in my mid-twenties and for probably the wrong reasons decided not to um, and I'd always fancied the idea of being in a business school environment um, and one of the things that really attracted me of the Sloan program was the, 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 the nationality diversity. I think we were, we were pre a bit of a reorganisation of Sloan so I think we had, there were 59 of us um, and 34 different countries were represented and we were not quite 50-50 men and women but we were pretty close um, so there was that that diversity uh, I would think I was only about three of us who came from financial services so I was mixing with people with completely different nationality backgrounds completely different business backgrounds 
that, 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 that than I'd ever experienced before, and that massively opened opened my mind and I think my, my, my emotions as well uh, in a very positive way. I'm sure what we've what we've been hearing resonates right right across the room. This would not be a Sloan gathering if there weren't a multitude of questions bubbling up um, in the room. So let's open to the floor. What questions do you have for our panellists? And we've got some roving microphones. Very occasionally, Sloan gatherings can be a little shy, but that doesn't last for long, in my experience. David. I mean, it's easy to talk about the positives. What about the negatives? (laughs) <laughs> Good. Well, I can have a go. I have to say my, uh, my first six months back after Sloan and my 21 years of BP, that, those were the worst six months of that entire period. And uh, I really lost my way. I felt disoriented because you get so much stimulus and intellectual stimulus at the business school and with the cohort. Yeah. Uh, and suddenly you find yourself back in, in, a, in a, certainly in a big corporate in quite a small box. It's very, very difficult to adjust. Uh, it, took me, uh, it took me a few months mm-hmm. to do that. Building on that, what, what advice would you give for people who are kind of coming out of Sloan imminently because we've got 2016ers scattered around the room? Mm-hmm. Well, um, I mean, I think, I think for me, you know, the biggest thing that I took out of Sloan was, um, uh, and it was a quote, one of our leadership speakers, we were many speakers through the year, but the one I always remember was at the very end of the, uh, the second semester and in, in, we were in the New York City trip. Uh, and he, he challenged the class to say, look, the Sloan year will be the best year of your life if you can answer two questions. Uh, and the first one is, um, you know, if you can define how, what you want to contribute, so what it is you want to leave behind. Uh, and second of all, what's your, life pur- what's your life's purpose? And so if you can, the, the, the bit that I would encourage people leaving Sloan is if you can think very carefully about what it is you want to do with the, you know, the second half of your life or the, you know, the third third of your life, um, uh, and try to match your life's purpose with your, you know, your your professional work so that the two are aligned. Mm-hmm. I think that's the greatest mm-hmm. challenge, and that was where I struggled when I came back from Sloan because mm-hmm. I thought they were, mm-hmm. they were misaligned. So if you can get your your purpose and your professional work to align, I think you're you'll be in good you'll be in good shape. Something that we do on the the LBS Sloan program early on is to ask Sloans to um, sketch out their dream job mm-hmm. on finishing the program. Uh, and then the, the sneaky second assignment is if you roll the clock forwards, how many years? 60 years at least. What might the funeral eulogy be like? And then, and then do we see any connection between the two, which would come right back to that question of purpose. And um, I, I believe that, again, runs very strongly through the Stanford program yeah. as a theme. Now, um, we, we'd had David's question, how about the negatives, which, which by the way, um, is a great Sloan question. Um, Sloans are renowned for challenging, which is what makes it so much fun as a professor to be with them. Mm-hmm. Could there be anything negative about life on the Stanford Sloan? Um, I think uh, the beginning yeah. is a lot of people because they... I used to joke in the beginning that it's like a six social experiment to take people that have been working for 10, 20, 30 years and are used to being experts in their field and always knowing the answer and always being ready to lead and, 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 uh, and speak up and putting them in classrooms where they know absolutely nothing. And what generally would happen is people would talk absolute rubbish. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I think that there's the, uh, that learning curve of... of uh, recognizing that you know nothing about the topic and you should think first and and really being humbled and I think that's an incredibly valuable uh, valuable lesson that you learn initially and then you get over and then uh, and then you start to engage much more productively and fruitfully so a negative that, that turns into a positive um, I, I'd say the other negative that I think that there is and, and this is something that perhaps the three schools can work on together is uh, perhaps in understanding the market of what Sloan is and, and what this experience is, because there really are only three schools that do Sloan as it is. I think there are a few more that are mm-hmm. doing kind of uh, later stage full-time education programs that are immersive. And I think there's a tr- tremendous amount of value to it, but I, I don't think there's a lot of awareness mm-hmm. uh, in the market and industry about that. And I think that that's a challenge. Mm-hmm. Great. Now, we had a hand going up, and yeah. we've got a microphone in hand. I have a question work that you've done with a lot of senior executives and coaching, which I assume is a group very much like this one. What trips us up? 
What do we all need to work on? Um, I'm not saying it applies to the Sloan, the Sloans in this room, but I think the the biggest subject that I work with with pretty much all my clients, and they are typically between youngest would be sort of mid thirties, the oldest are up to you know, 60s and people on boards and so forth. Uh, and even at that stage, um, and this picks up on some of the themes from this morning, I think people in the business world still uh, underestimate and underrate the importance of what I would call the, 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 the relational aspects uh, of, what, of what we do in work. Mm -hmm. Still people concentrate on the what, not on the how. Uh, they concentrate on what needs to be done rather than how we're doing it. Um, and tend to concentrate too much on process and not, and not enough on people and particularly the interaction, people's interactions with each other. Um, uh, so I'd say it's not advice, not something particularly relevant to, to any, any, any of you, but for, that's what I would say from my, my, work, mm -hmm. my coaching work would be my, my strongest observation. What what did um, make what make you move into coaching? What was what triggered that interest? Um, I think partly the the, the, the time at Sloan um, and the sort of st standing up, stepping away from the, the career conveyor belt uh, was the start of the process. Uh, mm -hmm. If I look back on my career in financial services, and I, and I still do some work in financial services, if I look back on it, it's much clearer now to me that it was always, to use a rather sort of vague term, the, the people aspects of what, 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 what I did rather than the process or the, the market, the financial market aspects. Uh, it was always, say, the man management and leadership of people that, that really motivated and interest me, interested me. Um, and in coaching, I have the, the luxury, the privilege, really, of being able to work with multiple clients on that very subject and people are prepared to pay me to do it, so it's a, it's a dream for me. One more question from the floor. <laughs> David. Uh, hi. Uh, uh, one of the reasons I came to the Sloan program was to f refresh my knowledge and update myself after a long career in one organization. <laughs> Now that I'm le I've left the Sloan program, one of the difficulties I find is keeping that level of knowledge up to date. We heard this morning how with the rate of increase of knowledge, we're all becoming relatively more ignorant as time goes on, even if we keep developing our knowledge. How have you find as, as Sloan graduates that you've kept yourselves reason, you know, up straight with what's current, given that the Sloan program mm. itself was uh, some time ago? Mm. Would you like to That's take a question? One? Uh, well, one thing I have done since leaving Sloan is stay connected with the, with the cohort. I think that in itself is a great stimulus um, because it keeps you alive to the ideas and what other people are experiencing and thinking. Um, one thing I do, uh, there was a class we took at MIT which was, uh, it was kind of macroeconomics, but it was basically making more aware of what's going on in the world. So I've, uh, I joined, the, uh, for those in Britain would understand it, Chatham House. It's uh, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, which is really a think tank and it invites uh, prime ministers, presidents, you know, prominent people from all around the world to come and talk. So that's something I actively do. I, you know, I joined up as a member. It's open to anybody. There's no you know, selection. But that's one way to keep me connected to the world and keep me connected to the ideas. Um, I'm, you know, it's difficult to stay connected to management theory as it evolves. But I think some of the big management theories, will it will probably percolate through to you in the course of time. So you know, the fail fast, fail the experimentation, that's something that's kind of all pervasive at the moment. But certainly, it's something, I have a big bookshelf of books. This will be another one. Uh, you know, I could probably dedicate more time to reading them to, to, to keep abreast of it. Rupert. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, as you get more senior, the requirement to have specialist knowledge goes down and down and down. And we had a quite a good example of that in our company, where they hired me for UK initially and somebody else who's a real specialist in, in data for continental Europe. And that specialist wasn't able to convert that specialism into communicating with people in a way that was successful. And you realize you only need a, you know, you need to know what you're talking about, but you don't need to be programming or something, it's AMI piece. You just need to understand how it replies. And keeping at that level is the best thing for me is always just getting out there and talking to people. And, you know, the most anecdotes I tell in the sales meeting is something I've just heard from somebody the night before, 
and they're often the most powerful, most vibrant, rather reading things, I think, in the, in the press. I just graduated. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, no, I, I mean, my hope is that I'll, I'll continue to stay engaged with the, with the cohort, and we've got you know, our WhatsApp group, and, and people are constantly sharing. I know we're still fresh, but we're constantly sharing ideas and books and lectures, and uh, uh, I'm also staying in the Bay Area, so I, I certainly hope to go and sneak into lectures and uh, keep the relationship up with uh, the professors that are teaching there and the, and the faculty and stay involved. I'm going to give a, an even blunter or a blunter version of, of Rupert's answer and, and build on what Rupert said. My advice would be stop worrying about learning anything new, about keeping up to date. You already know more than enough. Concentrate on, now on how you're going to use that knowledge. <laughs> And by the way, um, Robin's um, becoming one of our profs as um, a mainstay of one of our exec ed programs on strategy execution. And uh, as um, a, a footnote to that, um, you know what one of the best ways to learn is? To teach. <laughs> because you've got to be one chapter ahead of your class in that textbook. <laughs> so, Build, build, building on build, building, building on that um, that excellent question of um, how how how, how sh do we keep learning? Should we keep learning? Reflecting on what you'd like for those coming after you, because the Sloan program is something that has evolved, will continue to evolve in all three schools. In what ways um, would you like to see the Sloan program evolving in future? Because this is such a, an extraordinary opportunity, as Gil was saying, such a rare opportunity for full-time mid-career education. Um, we are incredibly privileged, having been part of something like this, and I'm sure we'd all want to shape the very best for those who come after us. So as a, as a final question from, for, for each of the panellists, um, what would you want to see Sloan become? Perhaps we could start with you, Nalan. Uh, well, certainly, I mean, I echo the thought. I think the Sloan brand, uh, we talked about a lot about it when we were at the school, but um, <laughs> I think there's strength in, them, you know, in the three schools, three very prominent schools, so I would like to see that to be you know, uh, more prominent. Uh, but for me, um, I mean, I haven't thought about this in terms of repositioning, you know, market positioning relative to other schools or other programs. Uh, the beauty for me for Sloan was um, it gives you, the, you know, the, the time and the place, the environment to, to really take a pause and think about what it is you want to do with the, you know, the final mm. chapter of your, of your working lives. Um, so it gives you that space to think about that and uh, align the, you know, the meaning that you're seeking to get in your work. Uh, but it also gives you the cohort and a, a group of people that you can share those thoughts with. Uh, and I think that's very unique because I certainly, through my mm -hmm. work colleagues and you know, family friends, wouldn't have the opportunity or they wouldn't be disposed of those types of conversations. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's about thinking what, you know, it's a space to think about what you really want to do and then having the cohort to support your, the evolution of your thinking and, and to encourage you uh, as you, you think about that. So for me, that's the core of Sloan, mm. uh, more, maybe more so than the, the technical skills. So I'm not thinking about it, about repositioning relative to other programs. I just think, mm. you know, there's a place in the world for programs uh, such as the three we've, we, we have. And we have a multiplier effect, which yeah. is apparent in this very room, in this very room. So the Sloan brand becomes progressively stronger. The more we do, the more we, the more we run events like this, the more we build a network effect. What would you like to see Sloan become, Rupert? Well, if I combine two things, one thing Robin said, which is, is true, which is it's, people often say it's the second job after Sloan that really is the one that uh, matters. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, I don't know about you, but I felt very rushed on Sloan. Everything was happening so quickly. The year was just disappearing. It's, uh, it's almost like if you put those two concepts together, mm. it's, it's as if you need, say, a couple of weeks, maybe two years after Sloan, when everybody comes together, mm. because you have, don't always have time to process everything going on. And, and you know, I come to something like this today, and I'm full of ideas and starting to sort of open myself back up to all this way of thinking about the world, but it's, it's too short. You know, I'm going to go back on Monday and be you know, much wherever I am. Um, so I think that might be helpful. Of course, the problem of how many people will be able to make it, and people have moved on and gone to a different country or something. But, Something like that would, would solve those two problems, I think, mm. that have been raised before. A Sloan Turbo that might come sometime well, after the main program. Yeah, post, yeah, or, yeah top, is it Turbo or Top Up? Or, yeah. Like being in the reserves, almost. You know, like, yeah. Every, cool. every, every couple of years you get cool, a week. Called yeah. up for active well, duty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like that. What would, what would you like, because you're, you're freshest um, among the panellists um, in terms of closeness to 
the program right. uh, as, as it runs on campus. Is there anything that you'd like to see it doing differently? So I, I think, um, and I don't know how it was for LBS and MIT, uh, I think one of the greatest challenges is these are one-year programs and there's very little overlap from one year to the next. Mm. So I think that kind of sense of continuity and, and uh, learning of the culture mm. and of what it means to be slow and is, is kind of mm. lost. So if there's a way to kind of bridge that a little better mm -hmm. and to have more uh, inter-year and perhaps to program integration, I, I think that would certainly help uh, in terms of acclimating faster mm. and being able to, to take advantage of everything that Sloan has to offer. Um, so I, I think that's one aspect, and the, the second is uh, kind of what I mentioned earlier in terms of, I think the Sloan programs definitely do reinforce one another, but even, even more than that, I, I think there's a very strong place for uh, education for executives, kind of mid-career education mm. um, beyond the EMBA. Uh, and I think there's a tremendous amount of value in that, and it's something that I've realized. And I would love to see that as, as a more formal category that is mm -hmm. understood, recognized, and, and that mm -hmm. more people do. I think it, it, there's a lot of value to those that miss the young MBA boat when you were 26. A couple of our colleagues on the faculty have um, recently published a book called The Hundred Year Life. This is Linda Grattan and Andrew Scott. And uh, of course, one of the immediate questions the hundred year life idea prompts is, will those hundred years be fun? <laughs> <laughs> but what they will certainly mean is that it's not just one more chapter that we're looking at, yeah. but multiple chapters. And to Gil's point, there's a very interesting question around how we may prepare people effectively, not for a career which um, ends with going on holiday at the age of 55, um, but how we prepare people to successively renew their careers, revisit their aspirations, so that in fact that 100 year life, if we do live that long, is a fantastic opportunity rather than a drudge. Robin, what would you want to see yeah, Sloan become? I'm going, to make, I'm going to make two points, one general and one very specific to LBS. The general point is, I think, for all three schools, they push the dial uh, away from skills training a bit further and make it even more personal development. Mm -hmm. When you're on Sloan, you think learning the, learning the skills will somehow be terribly useful in the rest of your life. It's not really. It's the personal development part that, that transforms you. The second point, I'm making a per, very parochial uh, comment to London Business School, and I hope Andrew Lickerman's watching, watching this on television, um, which is that the school has innovated, great thing, uh, and changed, I gather, the Sloan format so that you can complete it in seven months and then, excuse my language, naff off. Um, I think that is a very bad thing to do. I think part of the part of the experience. <laughs> part of the experience is being together for 12 months in an incredibly intensive environment, uh, and that's one of the things I look back on with huge affection. So I hope LBS is brave enough to reverse uh, that particular innovation. Great. And I would strongly second that because the principle is that this is a program that should never end. And what we should do now, before we move on to the next part of the afternoon, is to give a huge round of applause to our panellists. shown that the, the Sloan story is absolutely not just a story about skills, nor is it even just a story about careers. Um, Sloan's a story about life. So, I believe we are exactly on time. Would that be right? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, no. That was well done. That was great. great seeing you again. That, that brought back memories. <laughs> oh, yeah. great, to, great to meet you. Um, great that is why you're supposed to go from there. Where were you living? Oh, you're in a dorm.